faithful, loyal, and honest. But how many of us are honest today? The only thing we'll be serving is to suspect each other. From the quiet and assuming elementary school pupil in the border town of Daura, which is situated barely a shouting distance from Nigeria's border with the Niger Republic, he grew into a mythical lanky figure. A man whose name was only whispered in gripping fear behind the sanctuary of locked doors by his fellow countrymen. But how it has to do with the Human Rights uh, Administration. Uh, so many politicians and uh, other Nigerians were clamped in detention without uh, opportunity of having fair hearing in the law courts. I think that was the main uh, point against Buhari administration. He was the once quietly disposed secondary school classmate of Sheo Musa Yeradua the charismatic number two man in the Obasanjo military dictatorship and elder brother to the late President Umaru Musa Yeradua. Sheo Yeradua died ignobly in suspicious circumstances at the hand of the dreaded General Sani Abacha, whose government he served as the chairman of Abacha's Petroleum Trust Fund, PTF. It is on record that Yeradua shed a dormitory with Muhammadu Buhari Thus commencing a lifelong but not always easy friendship. With Buhari, Yaradua joined the school cadet corps. He is Muhammad Buhari, retired Army Major General and former military dictator who overthrew the civilian administration of Al Haji Sheikh Aliu Shagari barely 14 weeks into Shagari's second term in office. He is General Muhammadu Buhari, the chairman of the Petroleum Trust Fund, a super parastata that operated like an alternative government of sorts under General Sani Abacha. He is General Muhammadu Buhari, a man whose military regime became the first to sentence a woman to death by firing squad. This is the story of the real Buhari, the man behind the mask, the real person behind the personality. Ramrod, stiff, never smiling. In his so well written 2009 best selling autobiography, Peter Anahoro, arguably Nigeria's finest journalist of all time, described Buhari as ascetic. His profile, coupled with his court followership and fame among the fringe of the religious extreme, easily fits that of a religious zealot and a fundamentalist. To cap this view, the Nobel laureate, Professor Wale Shoinka, once described him as an ethnic bigot. Since Nigeria's return to democracy in 1999, the perennially stone-faced, ashen-looking, cold staring general has emerged from obscure political wilderness and self-imposed public exile as epitomized by his tight-lipped silence in the dreaded years of the Abacha Draconia dictatorship to become the nation's perennial presidential aspirant. Buhari's name is the recurrent decima of presidential elections since 2003. 2015 is Buhari's fifth shot at the Nigerian presidency. The first in 1993 was successful through the barrel of a gun when he overthrew a democratically elected government. But all others have failed at the ballot box. Buhari was the governor of the northeastern state which comprises the present-day Borno, Yobe, Adamawa, Gombe, Bauchi, and Taraba states. Buhari's Supreme Military Council, January 1984. The makeup of Buhari's Supreme Military Council troubled Southerners. 
virtually all of the senior positions in the Supreme Military Council were occupied by Northern Muslims. Of the 16 members of Buhari's ruling Supreme Military Council, 11 were from the North, while 5 came from the South, with only Commodore Ebitu Ukiwe representing the Southeast and Brigadier Ola Oni from Lagos, who represented the Southwest. Fela Nikola Kwakute wondered why Sheu Shagari was not put on trial by Buhari. Neither was any of the Muslim Northern governors of the ruling National Party of Nigeria MPN, except Ape Aku of Benue State, who was a Christian. But governors of the Christian South and other public office holders were jailed. In his inimitable parlance, Fela said, Driver get accident, na conductor Buhari charge go court. Under Buhari's regime, anyone could be detained at his whim using draconian decrees. The list of those incarcerated under Buhari's regime is lengthy. Sam Mbakwe, Fela Kuti, Femi Aribisala, Bisio Mabanjo, Bolaige, Aoudou Obe, and so many others. Individual security was so bad under Buhari that when Pa Adekunle Ajashin was acquitted twice by courts that found him not guilty of Buhari's accusation of corruption, the Buhari regime rearrested and detained him under decree number two. While Buhari detained Tai Sholari and denied him medication, even while Tai Sholari was having persistent asthmatic attacks. Specifically, due to his criticisms of the successful military administrations, he incurred the wrath of the Buhari regime and became a victim of its much dreaded state security detention of persons decree number no. 2 of 1984. Disturbed by the violation of his fundamental human rights, Sholari, through his lawyer, Dr. Olu Omagorua, filed a writ of habeas corpus at the Lagos High Court seeking the detainee's production in court and Sholarin's subsequent release. The court ruled in Sholarin's favor and by this ruling, the court invalidated the detention order under which Sholarin was incarcerated. When Buhari took over, he detained Bisio Nobanjo of Ogun State. Kayade Latif Jakonde, aka Babake Kere of Lagos State, Sam Mbakwe Imo State, Ape Aku Benue State, and Professor Ambrosali of the defunct Bender State, now Edo and States. These were men who were regarded as arguably the best performing governors of the Second Republic. Oleye Victor Olabisio Nobanjo was known as an unpretentious and plain speaking man and his administration of Ogun State was considered a model at the time and later. On May 13, 1982, he commissioned Ogun Television. The Ogun State University, founded on the 7th of July 1982, was now renamed Olabisi or Nobanjo University on May 29, 2001 in his memory. He also established the Abraham Adesoyan Polytechnic. He was in prison for 20 months, and he did not last long after release from Buhari's Gulag, for he died shortly after. These men were plagued by terrible diseases while in prison. Ambrosali of Edo State, the late Governor Ape Aku of Benue State, the late Bisio Nobanjo of Ogun State. Professor Ambrose Ali and Samun Bakwe died prematurely. Ambrose Ali came out of Buhari's prison blind. Ambrose Ali was so poor that the Edo State government had to build him a befitting house after his death so as to hold a decent burial. General Buhari impounded the official passport of Papa Obafemi Awulowo and denied the old man visits to his doctors at Mayo Clinic, Royster, Minnesota, United States of America, for the years he ruled Nigeria. Papa Awolowo's passport was only returned to him with courtesies by General Ibrahim Babangida after the coup of 1985 that had ousted Buhari from power. 
Baba Lingida sent Lieutenant General Aliyu Muhammad Kusau to return Baba's passport with apologies from the Nigerian Armed Forces. All these bring to mind the satirical song of Yubatu Gunde in the mid-60s, where similar incidents plagued the Nigerian political landscape. The years of the wild, wild west. Try as much as the military dictatorship of General Muhammad Buhari did to rope in him for alleged corruption, which were never substantiated, Ekweme came out as white as snow. In fact, he spent the entire years of the Buhari regime in prison, but was never one day charged before a law court or a tribunal. Though he was under prison custody at Kirikiri for 20 months, the Buhari regime could not find one shred of evidence of corruption to nail Ekweme. When he turned 80 years in 2012, Dr. Alex Ifan Chuku Ekweme gave a thought-provoking interview. He was arrested and detained on the night of the coup by Buhari. During this interview encounter, Ekweme declared, after the Buhari regime put me in prison for serving my country so selflessly, I felt Nigeria was not worth dying for or sacrificing for. First, I was locked up in Boni Camp, Lagos. From there, I was moved to Kirikiri Maximum Security Prison. When I was locked up in Kirikiri in January 1984, in February, this same Buhari, who was president of Nigeria, though unelected, called a press conference and said that I, Alex Ekweme, was responsible for all the corruption in government, that I was in charge of petroleum. First, I had nothing to do with petroleum. The minister of petroleum in our time was the president, like in Abacha's time. And the special advisor on petroleum was Yaya Diko. Buhari cannot even get one evidence to support what he was saying because they were lies. Blantant lies. It is curious that why Ekweme, the incorruptible vice, was in prison for 20 months. His boss, President Shagari, whose failure led to the coup, was kept in the presidential palace in Ikoi. In 1983-84, Buhari protected Anwar Ibrahim, the MPN Ninja State Governor, who was arrested in Heathrow Airport in London with 14 million pounds sterling and several millions of naira and dollars. He was never persecuted. Buhari protected Sheo Kangiwa, MPN Sokoto State Governor who conducted and supervised the famous Bakulori massacre of poor peasant farmers whose lands were appropriated without compensation. Ironically, Ayo Jeumi and Professor Ambuzali, the European Governor of Bender State, came out of prison blind as a result of imprisonment on false charges by Buhari. Buhari engineered the scrapping of one of the f most foresighted policies of the UPN Latif Jakonde led civilian government of Lagos State when he took over, which was the desire to improve transportation in Lagos and regenerate the city, which was the federal capital at the time. In 1982, the Jakonde government signed a $700 million contract for the Metroland project with a French consortium comprising of about 19 firms. The Lagos state government was required to pay only 10% of this money, while the balance was to be paid by the consortium. But Buhari scrapped the project, and Nigeria forfeited $60 million already deposited for the project. Even worse, Buhari ordered the judicial murder of Bernardo Gedebe, who was sentenced to death under Decree 20 for a crime he committed before Decree 20 was enacted whereas he carried a lighter sentence when he committed the crime. 
Buhari refused to accept any pleas to spare Ogundebin's life. Hence, under Buhari, the state denied the individual his life at the whim of General Buhari. To summarize the state of security under Buhari's regime, Professor Wale Shoinka expressed shock that any Nigerian would ever contemplate voting for Buhari as a president. According to Shoinka, unquote, Buhari enslaved the nation. He gloated and glorified in a master slave relationship to the millions of his inhabitants. It is astonishing to find that the same former slaves, now free of their chains, should clamor to be ruled by one who not only turned their nation into a slave plantation, but forbade them any discussion of their condition. Unquote. Buhari also abolished food subsidies in Nigerian universities and thereby prioritized the introduction of malnutrition into universities. Kayabe Shoinka, the renowned journalist and author of Diplomatic Baggage, Mossad and Nigeria, the Deco story published in 1994, wrote, unquote, The Buhari government, in prosecuting his war on corruption, gave the National Security Organization, NSO, unprecedented powers of arrest and detention. The regime promulgated the State Security Detention of Persons Decree No. 2 of 1984, which gave the NSO the power to detain anyone suspected to be a security risk indefinitely. All forms of freedom were restricted and there was vagrant deprivation of fundamental human rights. Decree 2, 1984, the State Detention of Persons Decree, was Buhari's sword of Damascus. Under this decree, journalists were hunted and jailed. More than a dozen press houses were closed down. Beko Ransom Kute, Taisha Lari and Haruna Ademo were all jailed under this decree. Labor unions and professional associations were proscribed and banned. The Nigerian Medical Association, NMA, the National Association of Resident Doctors, National Association of Nigerian Students, and the Academic Staff Union of Universities ASU. The list was endless. The impression that was created in the minds of people in the time of Buhari, especially Buhari and Idiabo, was that this is the time to be sober, the time not to smile. The Nigerian Bar Association, NBA, boycotted all proceedings of Buhari's military tribunals. The world's the National Security Organization, NSO, Nigeria's first secret police service, which was on hand to intimidate, harass, and detain protesters and demonstrators, students, lecturers, critics and activists, and civil servants who dared embark on strikes. By October 1984, Buhari had retrenched 200,000 Nigerian civil servants. On the 15th of April 1985, Buhari announced the expulsion and deportation from Nigeria of more than 700,000 foreigners, especially from Ghana and other West African nations. It continues to be economically and politically disrupted by the mass movement of workers expelled from Nigeria. Almost 900,000 have already returned to Ghana alone. Sometimes the convoy stretches for 300 miles. Many workers had to sell all their possessions to get this far. Taxi and truck drivers are accused of charging outrageous prices, but many workers believe that staying behind in Nigeria meant prison or even worse. And they are killing many people. If you don't go, your life is at risk. Whether you like it or not, you should leave. The deadline of May 10th was set. All illegal immigrants must leave Nigeria in less than four weeks. It was a massive exodus, but it was not the first time this will occur. In April 1985, six Nigerians were convicted and condemned to death for drug trafficking by Buhari's Special Military Tribunal, most of them women. Lasukomi Awolala, Oladele Omoshebi, Jimmy Adebayo, Mrs. Sidikat Tairi, Miss Shola Oguntayo, and Gladys Iyama. 
Gladys Iyama, locked at the federal maximum security prisons in Kirikiri, was a crippled mother of two paraplegic children and was the first woman in the history of Nigeria to be sentenced to death by firing squad. The Buhari government knew the implication of executing a paralyzed mother of two and the sentence was secretly approved. The Gloria Ocon case was rife. In 1985, Gloria Ocon was arrested at the Aminukano International Airport on drug trafficking allegations. The case was traced to persons in government who provided security support for their couriers. Gloria Ocon was said to have died in detention. The cause of the death was kept secret. T date, Gloria Ocon is a mystery dating back to Buhari's days in power. For a man with so much skeletons in his past, Buhari should have been compassionate enough to reach out to families of individuals who were victims of his British past and seek genuine restitution. When Buhari said ruthlessly, he meant it. During the 41-year-old Major General's time in power, Nigerians came to understand what it meant to live in fear. With his partner, 41-year-old Major General Tunde Diago, a program to save the country was designed. They called it the War Against Indiscipline, with emphasis on war. Buhari is part of a past well let alone. Only the future should matter, and nothing about him speaks to Nigeria's future. On the 20th of March 1984, the Buhari Idiagon regime launched the war against indiscipline. Why? To little but important everyday manifestations of indiscipline, such as rushing into buses, constituting ourselves into public nuisances, working without commitment. Up to this moment, there has been no formal declaration of war against indiscipline. It is my pleasure, therefore, to declare today the launching day for the war against indiscipline. The problems Idiago highlighted were real, and most of the solutions he suggested that day. The issue was how he and Buhari implemented their campaign. They pursued a brute force and highly physical campaign, which inevitably made them unpopular with ordinary Nigerians. Many Nigerians will never forget the Koboko or Bulala or horse whip lashes that lacerated their backs for not queuing up at bus stations or for even dropping a piece of paper. Soldiers beat up policemen on the streets. Civilians were regularly harassed by uniformed men to the point that they were bloody civilians. Men were forced to do the fresh jump, humiliated in front of their wives and children. Also, General Buhari's reign witnessed the beginning of religious fundamentalism in Nigeria. In February and March 1984, the Maitasili sect, under the leadership of Musa Makaniki, unleashed terror on the populace in Yola Adamawa state and about 1,000 lives were lost. There was also the authoritarian Decree 4, under which it was a punishable offense for anyone to publish any material that was deemed as embarrassing to any government official. On the 11th of April 1984, operatives of the NSO arrested two journalists, Tunde Thompson and Nundukai Rabo of the Guardian newspaper, were brought before a military tribunal and accused of forcefully accusing public officers even if what the journalists wrote were right. On the 2nd of June 1984, a summon from the tribunal was sent to the accused and it read, from two public officers protection against first accusation decree number four of 1984 summoned to accused that you Tunde Thompson and Andrew Kairabo of the Guardian newspaper limited Rutam House Isola 
on April 1, 1984, at Rutahamsi Solo in Lagos, did publish four statement contrary to Section 101 of the Decree Number no. 4 of 1984. You are therefore summoned to appear before the tribunal mentioned above, sitting at Federal High Court on the 4th of June at the hour of 9 a.m. in the forenoon to answer the said complaint. Unquote. Their employer, the Guardian Newspaper Limited, was also accused. On Decree 4, Buhari has remained unrepentant. It did not matter whether the story reported was true or not. If my regime did not like it, the writer will go to jail. Becker Lowlery Ransom Kote, popularly known as Becker, was chairman of the Lagos branch of the Nigerian Medical Association and later is national deputy. In 1984, his brother, Fela, was arrested at the airport as he was preparing to leave for a U.S. tour on what Amnesty International described as spurious charges of illegally exporting foreign currency. Using the new draconian decree that allowed for indefinite detention of political opponents, the government of General Muhammad Buhari sentenced Fela to 10 years in jail. Ransom Kote, using the Medical Association platform, began a campaign to get the decree revoked and get Fela and all those detained released. But in fact, Beko himself was jailed and only released in 1985 when Buhari was overthrown by General Ibrahim Babangida. Against the background of the judicial murder of Owo, Ogedengbe, and Ojuwalakbe, one can understand the Sharia mindset of General Buhari. Even his actions predate that of the Taliban, a living modern-day apostle of the Hammurabi's code of law. An eye for an eye. Now, there was the case of the 53 suitcases involving the father of Buhari's ADC, the then Colonel Mustafa Jokolo, whose father was the Emir of Gwandu and Buhari's half-brother. Mustafa Jokolo helped his father, the Emir of Gwandu, to smuggle into the country through the Muratala Mohammed airport 53 suitcases suspected to contain foreign currency, which the then administrator of the Lagos Airport Customs Command, Al Haji Atiku Abubakar, was not allowed to search. This was in spite of the fact that the Buhari administration had placed a ban on importation of currencies. On the 5th of July 1984, a team of Nigerian security operatives led by Major Mohammed Yusuf and the Israeli Kassas were on hand to kidnap and bundle back to Nigeria Umaru Diko. Umaru Diko was drugged and put into a crate that was labeled as diplomatic baggage. An empty Nigerian Airways Boeing 707 plane was already waiting at the London Stansted Airport, waiting for him to be extradited back to Nigeria. He was abducted right in front of his home and put in a van and driven to the airport, where he was passed off as diplomatic luggage from the Nigerian embassy. Diko said in an interview with the BBC in 1985, unquote, I remember the very violent way in which I was grabbed and hauled into a van with a huge fellow sitting on my head, and the way in which they immediately put on me handcuffs and chains on my legs. The Nigerian Airways crew was detained. Buhari responded by ordering a British Caledonia plane that was already in the air flying from Lagos to London via Kano to be returned back to Lagos where it was also detained by the Nigerian authorities. Immediately, the United Kingdom released the Nigerian Airways crew. Buhari also freed the British plane to fly back to London. Seventeen men were arrested and four of them were later sentenced to years ranging from 10 to 14 years. All of them were later released after spending six to eight and a half years in jail and were silently deported. 
Bradley retaliated too by promptly picking up two British engineers in Nigeria and slamming 14-year prison sentences on them. To get Umaru Diko, Bowery turned to an Israeli businessman and a con man known as Elisha Cohen. Mr. Cohen, who had originally come to Nigeria in the 60s, was a representative of Reynolds, a subsidiary of the Israeli construction company Sole Bonaire. And while in Nigeria, he became friends with a lot of military officers like Obasanjo, with whom he did a lot of business. Buhari gave Mr. Cohen $5 million, and with Rafindadi, who was the head of the NSO, and Major General Haladu Hananiya, the Nigerian High Commissioner to Britain, and Group Captain Bernard Bamfa, the Managing Director of the Nigerian Airways, they hatched the plot to kidnap Diko. Did your government plan this kidnapping? Why was one of your officials at Stansted Airport last night? I'm not aware of that. You're not aware, but it was one of your officials. I wasn't aware. Why is the aircraft, the British Caledonian aircraft, held in Nigeria? I'm not aware of that one. Have you As the Minister of... What did you tell the Minister Despite General? the High Commissioner's denials, 17 people, of most of them the Nigerians, are now minister. being questioned about the kidnapping. 14 are being held at the High Security Paddington Green Police Station. Most of the 14 are Nigerians but two are believed to be Israeli mercenaries who were found inside crates at Stansted last night with Mr. Deco. The entire crew of a Nigerian freight plane that should have been leaving Stansted last night is also being questioned. Paul Davis, News at One, Paddington Green Police Station. Immediately after the Umaru Deco kidnap saga, the British satirical magazine Private Eye lampooned the incident and mocked Nigeria with one of its most famous headlines. Fly Nigeria, it's a great way to travel. According to Peter Inara, unquote, it was the most dastardly act ever sanctioned by an African government outside its borders. The disgraceful incident took Nigeria's reputation into a tailspin worldwide, unquote. Even the second school classmate, Kinsman, and friend, Shao Yaradua, in his official biography, said his frustration with Buhari was, unquote, the absence of a transitional agenda. But he also regarded Buhari's failures as a result of overly authoritarian instincts, including his inability to maintain a united front among senior commanders. One year and eight months after the terrible two wrecked the Second Republic, the Buhari Ijagban Double Act was thrown out of office in a classical palace school. According to Peter Inaro, unquote, Ijagban, the regime's Rottweiler, was in Mecca performing the Hajj, which left his mate, David Buhari, desperately exposed. Army Chief of Staff Major General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida emerged as the new leader, supported by the coup announcer. Major General Sani Abacha, an enigmatic schemer, Nigerians will come to love to hate." Unquote. Disaffection with Buhari had been evident for months and his removal somehow was expected. At a parade like this, he and his colleagues survived at least one assassination attempt by 42 army officers. Well, Buhari has not delivered the goods. He has not been able to decide on what to do with the detainees from Shehu Shigari's previous regime. Uh, he has not come up with a comprehensive economic policy. Uh, he has built himself into a corner. In the words of Peter Inara, unquote, the two terrors began to construct the Nigeria of their vision. Fascism without the Hitler straight arm salute. Among their emphatic achievements, was the execution of a female convict by a firing squad, a first by a military regime in Nigeria. The scope of state violence and the innovation of absurdly long prison sentences imposed by the courts frightened and disgusted most Nigerians. The regime shot itself in the foot when it recruited international brigands to carry out a gangland-style operation 
coordinated by a Nigerian army major in London. Unquote. It is on record that Boris tribunals sentenced their victims to terms ranging from 100 to 600 years in jail. Even Buhari himself considered that Yakubu Danjuma, Olisha Obasanjo, and Sheu Yaradua were reportedly contributive to his rise to power. But Buhari is a lone ranger with little or no loyalty traits. After Buhari seized power, Sheu Yaradua might have expected to have been consulted more widely or more frequently by his old friend than was the case in the matters of public policy. Even his two-time ADC and protege, the ex-major ex-colonel Mustafa Jokolo and later Emir of Gwandu, felt the relationship between Sheo Yaradua and Buhari had become one-sided. Unquote. I did not see what Buhari did for Sheo in return for all the things he did in sticking Sheo's neck out for him. Tafida thought Buhari's talents were being wasted as governor of Bruno State, so he made him minister of petroleum and the first chairman of the NNPC. Later, he made him military secretary over the grumblings of senior officers." Unquote. One of Fela's hit song was based on the disappearance of 2.8 billion Naira NMPC money that got stolen under Buari's watch as petroleum minister and head of the NMPC in 1978. 2.8 billion Naira All money is the missing 2.8 billion Naira All money is the missing Then set up inquiry they say money no lost to you, they dabaru everybody. Under intent public pressure, the Shadari government, which shortly took over thereafter from the military, set up a Senate probe which traced the money to a London Midland bank account belonging to Buhari, from where the money again got missing. It is not worthy that the value of 2.8 billion naira in 1978 was 3 billion dollars or in today's naira value 555 billion naira the then senate majority leader and chairman of the senate pro panel dr abubakar olusho lasaraki revealed this discovery in an interview with vera ifudo of the nigerian television authority nta when Ifudo reported this, she was sacked by the NTA. But the woman went to court and presented all the evidence and won in a case of wrongful dismissal. Saraki, until his death, never denied whatever he told the lady in the interview. Predictably, the first act of Buhari and his cohorts upon seizing power was to ransack the Senate and destroy all papers relating to the 2.8 billion naira probe and then they followed that up quickly with the indiscriminate arrest of politicians on january 14 2007 nobel laureate Shoinka laid down reasons why buhari doesn't deserve to be president unquote in buhari we have been offered no evidence of the surest prospect of change on the contrary, all evidence suggests that this is one individual who remains convinced that this is one ex ruler that the nation cannot call to order. Buhari was one of the generals who treated a commission of inquiry, the Oputa panel, with unconcealed disdain. Shankar went on to describe the execution of Owo, Ogedembe, and Ojualakbe as nothing short of premeditated murder. Shoinka further added, unquote, Since leaving office, Buhari has declared in the most categorical terms that he had no regrets over this murder and would do so again. Taisha Lavin was incarcerated by that regime and denied even the medication for his asthmatic condition, according to Shoinka, unquote. Tai did not ask to be sent for treatment overseas. All he asked 
was his traditional medicine that had proved so effective after years of struggle with asthma. And on the Septuagint general chief Adekule Ajashi, Shoyinka wrote, unquote, Ajashi was arraigned and tried before Buhari's punitive tribunal but acquitted. Dissatisfied, Buhari ordered his retrial. Again, the tribunal could not find this man guilty of a single crime. So once again, he was returned for trial, only to be acquitted of all charges of corruption or abuse of office. Was Chief Ajashin thereby released? No. He was ordered detained indefinitely. There was the case of Buhari's deliberate humiliating treatment of the then Emir of Kano, Alhaji Adobayeru, and Obasijuade, the army of Ife, over their visit to the state of Israel. This royal duo went to Israel on their private steam and private business. Since when, one may ask, did a free citizen of the Nigerian nation require the permission of a head of state to visit a foreign nation that was willing to offer that tourist a visa. The humiliation of Ado Bayero and the army of Ife demonstrates Buhari's total lack of respect for our traditional rulers and his gross disdain for what our traditional institutions stand for. In 1999, Obasanjo set up a management investigation panel to probe the activities of PTF under General Buhari. In the report of the investigative committee, it was revealed that the Afri Projects Consortium APC were contracted by PTF as management and project consultants. Buhari, as executive chairman of PTF, delegated them the power of engineer in all appropriate projects requiring such power. Afri Project Consortium APC then assumed absolute powers of initiation, approval and execution of all projects. To corroborate this, a PTF trustee, Group Captain Usman Jibril, remarked that, unquote, Bori brought in the late Ahmad Salhijo, his in-law, without informing us. He just saw these boys in the meeting. We asked him, who are these boys? He said they were just helping him take notes. We didn't know that he had engaged them as consultants without our knowledge and consent because we are all members. I told him that it was wrong. As trustees, if anything went wrong, we were the people that were prosecuted, not any other person. I asked them to change the procedure and they were not ready to change it. I said, okay, bye-bye, unquote. Sally Hija, who was curiously reported dead the very day a committee was set up to probe the PTF, was the owner of Afri Projects Consortium APC. APC was indicted for overcharging the PTF for up to about 25 billion naira by the Interim Management Committee and for also importing substandard soon to be expired drugs at overinflated prices. This caused to question the ability of General Muhammad Buhari to manage the Nigerian economy and fight corruption if elected president. In the weekend of January 11, 2015, these day newspapers reportedly got exclusive hold of the original copy of a report by the Petroleum Special Trust Fund PTF Interim Management Committee instituted on July 7, 1999 by the former President Olusha Obasanjo. By the time it was being disbanded by President Obasanjo in 1999, Records show that the APC Afri Projects Consortium had collected 181 billion 795 million naira and that Ahmed Salihijo, Buhari's brother in law, was his front at the organization. Buhari was the czar of this empire, but it was a clear case of the voice of Jacob 
and the hands of Isa. Although the 2011 election was deemed the cleanest so far since Nigeria's return to democracy in 1999, it was also, according to Human Rights Watch, among the bloodiest. And it is widely acknowledged that this is as a result of the fact that supporters of Buhari let loose the dogs of war. Over 800 Nigerians lay dead, and about 65,000 more were displaced. Much of the violence occurred in northern states when protests by Buhari supporters degenerated into violent riots or sectarian killings. The former FCT minister, Malam Nasri El Rufai, in his capacity then as the APC Deputy National Secretary in January 2014, said, and unquote, the next election is likely to be violent and many people are likely going to die. And the only alternative left to get power is to take it by force. This is the reality on ground. Deadline May 14, 2012. While speaking to supporters in Kaduna, Muhammad Dubuhari said, unquote, If what happened in 2011 should again happen in 2015, by the grace of God, the dog and the baboon will all be soaked in blood. In this context, Buhari's suggestion that 2015 could be violent cannot be taken lightly. Buhari's stance and antecedents on Sharia law for Nigeria are also so well documented. Buhari is credited with statements such like, unquote, Christians should not worry when Muslims chop off their own hands and hands in the name of Sharia because it is none of their business. Or, Muslims should only vote for Muslims or for those that will protect their interest." Unquote. Major General Muhammad Buhari attended the Lagos State Interdenominational Thanksgiving Service with his running mate, Professor Yemi Oshibanjo the General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor Enoch Adeboye, and Governor Babatunde Fashola. All these men had their wives by their sides except Buhari. For a man who pitches change and desires to rule a country made up of men and women in almost equal halves, it is an anomaly to have an invincible wife. Interestingly, this is not the first time that Mrs. Aisha Buhari would be left behind in her husband's aspiration. In 2003, she was not prominent when Buhari ran against Abbas Anjo. Buhari lost. Four years later, when Buhari ran against Umar Yaradua, nothing changed. Buhari lost. In 2011, Buhari lost. This is not a coincidence. Not for a man who sentenced a crippled mother of two children to death by firing squad. In 1971, Buhari got married to his first wife, Safinatu Buhari, who was the first lady of Nigeria between 1983 and 1985. They had five children together, four girls and one boy, Zulayat, Fatima, Musa, who is now deceased, Hadizat, and Safinatu, who was named after her mother, Buhari's first wife. In 1988, Buhari divorced his first wife, Safinatu. Many alleged that on release from house arrest and detention in Benin, he divorced Safinatu for daring to ask General Babangida's help to treat their daughter, who then was ill. In December 1989, Buhari got married to his second and current wife Aisha Buhari, Ni Halilu. They also, like in his first marriage, have five children together, one boy and four girls. They are Aisha, Halima, Yusuf, Zara, and Aminat. On 14 January 2006, Safina to Buhari, 
the former first lady of Nigeria and Buhari's first wife, died from complications of diabetes. In November 2012, Buhari's first daughter, Zulaiha Junaid, died from sickle cell anemia after having a baby two days before at a hospital in Kaduna. In an interview on Liberty FM Radio Kaduna on Sunday, June 2nd, 2013, Buhari has this to say, unquote, while the Niger Delta we are treated like kings, the Jamaatu al Sunnah leader Awati Wadjihad, which some people call Boko Haram, are being killed and their houses destroyed, unlike the special treatment given to the Niger Delta militants. This is injustice to Northern Nigeria. Buhari is a man who would seek power but abdicate responsibility when he gets it, and the facts don't lie. Jenga Igagbon personified nearly everything associated with the Buhari region. In a similar vein, when General Buhari was appointed by General Sani Abacha as Executive Chairman of the Petroleum Special Trust Fund PTF from 1994 to 1999, he did not take any personal charge of much of what happened throughout the period. Instead, he ceded his authority to a firm of consultants, Afri Projects Consortium APC, a firm owned by Buari's brother-in-law. APC was given exclusive powers to initiate projects, assess and approve their probable costs, execute the projects, assess the quality of execution, all without any higher supervision. Once again, General Buhari's lack of capacity to take responsibility was amply demonstrated when, after his nomination as the presidential candidate of the All Progressive Congress (APC), he couldn't immediately choose a running mate. Characteristic of the Buhari see that the responsibility for choosing a running mate to another national leader of the party, as Siwaju Bola Ahmed. In three consecutive elections, Nigerians have said they do not want Muhammad Buhari to be their president. But Buhari simply refuses to take no for an answer. But how honorable and loyal is the man Buhari? It is a veiled curiosity that he hardly kissed faith with his political partners and friends a character trait which might question loyalty and trust. Since 2003, he has been in the APP, the ANPP, the CPC and now the APC. The curious characteristics of a political Johnny Man. Buhari will be 73 years old in 2015. If he is voted president, and he runs for a second term in office, he will be president even at the age of 81 years. So for a man who was first head of state at the age of 41, that equates a period spanning 40 years. Let's stop a minute and ask, does Buhari possess the temperament to be Nigeria's president in a globalized 21st century? Former Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, Malam Nasri Erufai, and present APC governorship candidate for Kaduna State, wrote in a public letter in October 2010 that Buhari remains, unquote, perpetually unelectable, and that Buhari's insensitivity to Nigeria's diversity and his parochial focus are already well known." Unquote. Curiously today, barely four years later, Erufai's APC wants Nigerians to ride on Buhari's insensitivity and celebrate his parochial narrow-mindedness. It is obvious, Buhari will destroy Nigeria now, just as he did 
30 years ago. The rain may beat the leopard, but it cannot wash away its parts. Show me your certificate or your pullover. Buari pullover. No deceivers. Buari pullover. Buari pullover. Bad. Buari pullover. Buari pullover. Bivas. Buari pullover. Buari pullover. Show me your certificate or your pullover. Buari pullover. No they wash us. Buari pullover.